Hi everyone. Can everybody hear me well? Yes. Yeah, beautiful. All right, let's begin. Okay, well the first thing first things first, um, let's go on an obligatory whirlwind tour of some random stuff about me, where I work, and where I'm from. Because you know that seems to be the thing to do. So my name is Alan Skorkin. I'm known as Skorks around the interwebs. Uh, I usually look like that. Uh, obviously, I also look like this. Um, and like most people, if you Google my name, I'll actually come up first. But to make things easy, I'm Skorks just about everywhere. So Twitter, GitHub, and my blog is called Skorks.com. So feel free to add me or whatever. Open some issues on my projects. Um, that's fine. So I come from Melbourne, Australia, which, as it turns out, is really, really far away from here. <laughs> it's uh, pretty safe to say that out of everybody at this conference, I've traveled the longest and the furthest to be here. Which is pretty cool, because I was once at a conference where I traveled about 100 meters to be there. So I've done both things now. So I work for a company called Envato. Uh, I've only been there about three months, but they were nice enough to send me here. Um, and there are lots and lots of companies, I think, uh, which are way less successful, but are way, way more famous than Envato. So I thought I'd say a few words, since I'm obviously the only person here from that company. So one of the things we do is marketplaces for digital goods. So if you haven't done any WordPress, you would have heard of ThingForest. So that's uh, one of the things we do. It's probably one of the biggest whale sites in the world. We get, I guess it'll be somewhere around the 100 million page views a month mark. Um, we also have a blog, uh, a blog network, which is where I get to play with Rails and Ruby stuff. Doesn't get quite as many page views as marketplaces, but um, our traffic is still quite muscular. We get tens of millions of page views a month, which is pretty alright, I think. Yeah, so I'm writing, I'm writing a blog in Rails. Um, I never thought I'd be able to say that when people ask me what I was working on, but here we are anyway. Uh, in fact, when I tell people that they're laughing, I'm going, nah, man, like, what do you actually do? Seriously. It's a completely privately owned company in Vado, and we've never taken any outside investment. Half the company is in Melbourne, uh, in Australia. The other half works from all over the world. So as software developers these days, uh, we have pretty much infinite choices when it comes to work. But it's always nice to know there's another interesting place to consider if you're ever considering. So as I said, I come from Australia. Uh, and obviously, since I'm in the US, I can't very well not say a few words about Australia. So the expectation with uh, people from Australia is that they'll be into wild animals. So I'll try to honor that tradition and say a couple of words about a cool Australian animal. In this case, it's uh, this guy right here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a bold claim and say that this is the best animal in Australia. Here's why. So it's small and cute, but it has wicked big claws and it can dig really, really fast. It uh, doesn't strike you as much of a sprinter. I mean, have a look. Doesn't look like a greyhound or anything, but uh, it can actually run pretty, pretty quick, faster than most of us here. But here's the most interesting thing. Uh, I, I'm not playing with you. It will literally try to sit on invaders and crush them. So if you're ever in Australia and you see a small wild animal and it's moving you, you're probably in big trouble and you should run for your life. Which won't be any good because of this. <laughs> but it's still a nice thing to know. So anyway, enough random stuff. Let's, uh, let's talk about some Ruby and some Rake. So Rake is ubiquitous in the Ruby community. Every project you're ever likely to come across, the web or gem, is going to have some Rake in it. In fact, if you ever come a project uh, come across a project without a rake file in the root, it looks a little weird, just like a project without a readme. A while ago, I was writing some rake, and there are times
times in your life as a software developer when your tools just annoy you. For me, this was one of those times. Needless to say, I was feeling a little bit like this. And I kept asking myself the question that we all ask ourselves about every tool we've ever used. And the question is why? Why did you do it that way? I mean, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done it a better way. So in my case, it was why, Ray? Why? And it got me thinking, why indeed? Why Ray? I mean, Ray isn't particularly nice. How did it become so pervasive in the Ruby community? Is it just a matter of being around long enough? Why hasn't anything clearly superior come along to replace it? And why hasn't anyone switched to, everyone switched to that? So this was the start of a very long journey for me. <laughs> and I'll try to give you a sense of the journey over the next 30 minutes or so, and I'm sure it will be awesome. So every good story begins uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And as luck would have it, this is where the ancestor of Rake actually comes from. And I'm of course talking about Make. As we all know, Rake is based on Make, and Make comes from the sea world. <laughs> and that's the wrong sea world, I of course mean this one. And Rake is literally Ruby Make. And Make is extremely curious because there are so very many things wrong with it. But despite this, it's used so widely that it might, it might as well be the only tool of its kind in the sea world. And once again, it's this one. So if you've ever done some C programming, you may know some of this already, but uh, here's just some of the highlights, some of the shortcomings of Make. So Make is a programming language, but it has no lists or hashes, just strings. It has only limited support for conditionals like if statements. And in fact, it has only very limited support for things like loops, which makes it really, really hard to do useful things with it. All variables are global, because I don't know why, but as we all know, global variables are really awesome. And this one is familiar to most people. So any line specifying shell command must begin with a tab. And it can't be a set of spaces, it has to be a tab. Um, and the only thing I can really say about that is this. <laughs> So here's some more. Sometimes white spaces are significant, sometimes they're not. Commas are the same. And of course, a little bit of randomness in your programming language is really, really good because it keeps us on our toes. Make is, uh, has very poor performance. And in fact, it scales, its performance scales non-linearly with uh, the size of the project you use it on. So um, for a larger project, for larger projects, make will be much, much slower. And then there's this. The only real way to do it is to execute it over and over manually until you are sure that it more or less works. But of course, make is very unreliable, so sometimes when you execute it, it'll fail for no good reason. So you have to do make clean and try again and hope that it'll work this time. So it's a bit of a cycle. And that, of course, doesn't do anything for its, for its performance either. Make is the worst looking programming language in the world, because the worst one is this one. <laughs> and now this language here, it was specifically designed to make writing useful programs really, really hard. I'm not sure why, but that's, that's, that, that, that was the idea. Make, on the other hand, wasn't designed to make writing useful programs really, really hard. But sometimes it feels like that anyway. And I'll refer to this URL here for a host of other issues. But I will say one more thing. Make was so bad that GNU created Automake to help us generate make files. So what we have is make, which is the thing that we used to put together C projects. And then there's Automake, which is the thing that we used to put together the thing that we used to put together C projects. But of course, to use AutoMake, you have to use AutoConf. So we have AutoConf, which is the thing that helps us use the thing uh, that you used to put together the thing, 
that we used to put together the C projects. So it's a bit of a house of cards, and yet somehow we're still able to write significant software using niche tools. They are by proving once and for all that software developers secretly enjoy pain. <laughs> of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. C developers secretly enjoy pain. The rest of us just have a really high pain threshold. But that's make. Surely we've learned our lessons. Surely rake is much, much nicer. Well, in some ways it is, but we didn't learn nearly as many lessons as we think we did. Rake is just a Ruby D cell after all, so it's still Ruby under the hood, but let's take a closer look. So firstly, say what you will about make, but C needs something. We have to compile, we have to link, there are steps to be taken before we get the usable program in C. Ruby has no such troubles. We don't need to build or link anything. So in Rake, we have a build tool for a language that needs no build tool. And if we summarize what we know about Rake so far, we get this. It's based on a very popular but deeply flawed tool. And it's a solution in search of a problem. And so that's not a very auspicious beginning. But it almost feels, it almost feels like we had to find a use for Rake. So we did. Now, I've thought long and hard about the best way to describe what we use Rake for, you know, in Ruby. And here's my best effort. <laughs> so that's great. So we've scrutinized the idea. But let's look at the actual technology. What is so bad about Rake? So mine and everybody else's pet peeve is command line argument. Defining the tasks to take, to take arguments is extremely awkward. It looks like this. And of course, passing arguments to a is even worse. What do these arguments even mean? And which one is which? But at least it works, right? Well, let's try using it in Z shell. That's not very nice. I mean, what have we done to deserve that? <laughs> And, of course, you have to quote it, because that's obvious. That's the arguments and the name of the task. The real solution that most of us use is to avoid writing tasks that take arguments in the first place. You're better off just writing a special case of your task and maybe put the original task in a new one under a separate namespace to make it easier to understand. Speaking of namespaces, What's a good convention for namespacing rake tasks? Oh, I'm not too sure. It's kind of do what makes sense. Uh, kind of like your regular Ruby classes, really. Except we've been thinking and studying our own design for ages. There are many different principles. With rake, do what feels right is the only principle that I'm aware of. And how do you structure your rake files anyway? Maybe we just namespace our tasks and then put them all in one file and that works. But what about when it gets too big? How do you structure a set of break files? Well, maybe one namespace per file. But what if the namespace gets too big? Well then, how do you modularize it even more? And anyway, how do you implement the functionality of a rake task? You just write the code inside the task itself? That doesn't seem very modular. And how do you write specs for that? Maybe we can push the functionality uh, into a class and try to make each task implementation in one line. And that's a reasonably nice solution because it will bring us back to plain old Ruby OO design. And this is why having good design chops is a fundamental skill. But now Rake isn't really giving us any help. What about documenting array tasks? Well, we've got our one line of description. So hopefully you are really, really good at expressing yourself. This is C. And if you forget the one-liner, you get a mystery task. Because everybody likes surprises. <laughs> There's no way to even know that a task exists unless you read the code, so fun times can be had by everyone. <laughs> now I'm going to 
to go out on a limb and say that 90% of rape tasks out there have no specs. But we love specs in the Ruby community and cukes and anything that helps us make sure that our stuff actually works. So what gives? It's still code. We run some of these things in production. Makes me feel a little bit like this. But if you think about it for a while, you realize that it's not that surprising. Here's an example of a typical rake task, which I pulled out of Rails. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to agonize over methods that are longer than a couple of lines in my classes. But a rake task that looks like that, eh, it feels just fine. In fact, this one is probably all right. Sadly, you'll see these kinds of rake tasks all the time. The problem with rake, especially considering how ubiquitous it is, is that it has no idioms. We love idioms in movie. Here's some pretty awesome idiomatic movie, which I prepared earlier. Opinionated software has been our mentor for years. And it's a good thing. You can get significant work done with Rails just following the conventions. But rake is not opinionated. If anything, idiomatic rake is a monolithic task, untested, and hard to refactor. So once again, the question we, ask, we should ask ourselves is, does RAID encourage bad design? And in and of itself, it doesn't, but the way we've been using it is a problem. New programmers come to learn Ruby, they look at the code that has been written before, and overwhelmingly, badly written RAID tasks are everywhere. So the cycle of crappiness is perpetuated. But of course, rank is not all bad. No matter the lack of idioms, namespacing is a good idea, and uh, chaining rank tasks is pretty awesome. And of course, rank is a great name. That's, that's with R, like all good Ruby games should. <laughs> so anyway, I think the world should be a much nicer place with lots more good things and lots less bad things. And like politicians, though, as a software developer, I can actually roll up my sleeves and do something about my world. So let's go back to a highly relevant description of what Ray does. Well, it also kind of sounds like what we used to mainline apps for, random tools and scripts and stuff. So here's a thought. What if instead of writing rate tasks, we wrote command line apps instead. This might make you feel like this. Because you might be thinking this. So crap the script using option parser, that's not even that's even worse than rank. Those things have no structure whatsoever. And once again, how do you write specs for them? Well, we don't want to be doing that. What we want is a framework that will make writing command line apps easy. And it will make our command line apps awesome. Just like Rails or Sinatra make web apps easy and awesome. Surprisingly, I'm not the first guy who had that thought. But we'll come back to that. What do we mean when we talk about command line apps? Well, command line apps come in two basic flavors. There's basic command line apps like curl. They have no subcommands and have options and arguments. And there's command line suites like git which also have options and arguments, but can have subcommands as well. So what's so good about command line apps? Well, they're extremely familiar. We use them all the time. We use Mac, we use Linux, we use command line apps a lot. And of course, getting documentation about a command line app is really easy. We all know to do minus minus help, and it, will shoot, it should spit out something useful. And of course, passing options, unlike Ray, is part of the basic functionality. So special cases are really, really easy. And that's the Unix way. You know, a tool that does one thing and does it well is the Unix way. And Unix is awesome. Because we all want to have facial hair just like this. <laughs> and those are, of course, the original guys who invented facial hair. <laughs> but they also invented Unix, which makes them almost as awesome as this guy. There's a book called Build Awesome Command Line Applications in Ruby. I highly recommend you read it. 
if you want a crash course in what goes into a command line app in general. In the book, the author describes at a high level what makes a good command line app, but let's have a look at that. So a command line app should be easy to use. That's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's number one. It should be helpful. So if we do minus minus help, it should spit out something useful for us to understand how it works. <coughs> it should play well with others. So it's just part of the Unix ecosystem. It should be able to read the records input and output and do all those kinds of things, and it should just work. It should have sensible defaults for both options and arguments. You should be able to configure your command lines, and configuration should be simple. And of course, it should be easy to distribute, easy to test, and easy to maintain. But if you think about it, Reg doesn't measure up too well against these high-level ideas, which is great for me, because I get to come to Austin and do this presentation here. But in general, it's not so great for the community. And anyway, if we could create a command line framework that could tick all the boxes mentioned above, we should have a perfect replacement for Ray, right? Well, maybe. There are, there are already many different command line frameworks in the Ruby world that tick, that tick most of the above boxes. Like I said, I'm not the first guy to have had that idea. Here are just some of them. Now, most of those frameworks provide a DSL for building command line apps and possibly some support for configuration. This makes app build with those frameworks pretty easy to use and write. It also makes it easy to generate help text and provide sensible defaults. And you can distribute your apps as gems, which also makes it pretty simple uh, to update and maintain. So the question is, why are those frameworks still relatively niche? And um, why, why, why is Relic for Well, it's a standalone command line app gem is not the only context where we want to strip things up. We want to be able to write apps and suites, yes. But we also want to be able to write nice scripts for our web apps. And as a result, we want those scripting frameworks to support multiple environments. This also means the configuration for our apps should support multiple environments. And speaking of configuration, we sometimes want per machine configuration, per user configuration, as well as per project configuration, and often want to mix all those. None of the frameworks I mentioned above have support for any of that stuff. Well, let's look more deeply uh, at the features that a hypothetical awesome command line framework needs to provide in order to make us want to always use it as a default in place of Ray. So a nice DSL is a good stuff. But why not the focus on DSL? Sure, a readable syntax is nice, but we want it to fit into our Ruby design, not subsume it. So it would be nice if we had a DSL that we could just slot into our Ruby classes. We want Ruby with a little bit extra, not something that's written in Ruby, but tries very hard to look like something else. So here's an example. This seems reasonable. But if we want to write specs for the actual functionality, there's no nice way for me to hook into it using existing tools. And if it gets too big and I want to refactor, what do I do? What guidelines do I follow? This is something that's written in Ruby, but tries very hard to look like something else. On the other hand, there's this. This looks just like a regular class. It's very similar to the previous example, but if I want to write some specs of the functionality in an execute method, it would be very simple. And I can easily imagine how I, I would be able to write something that would, be, that would allow me to easily break apart these classes for refactoring purposes, and also to compose them. There's still elements of a DSL here, but it's just Ruby with a little bit extra. And there's documentation. We're all used to seeing something like this. So any app built with our framework should be able to produce this automatically. This is practically infinitely more documentation than we would get from Ray. And then there's environment aware apps. I mean, why doesn't every framework out there support this already? You know, we do a lot of web programming, we need this all the time. So for example, if my app is called blah, I should be able to just flick a switch, you know, set a configuration option, and have the ability to do things like this. I shouldn't have to build a boilerplate for this over and over. 
multiple levels of, the, of configuration. It would be really great. Machine level, user level, project level. But then that configuration should also be environment aware. For example, if your configuration is in JSON format, you want something like this. Or alternatively, you want to break things up into separate files per environment, just like Rails does. And the way, the ability for you to, uh, the ability for configuration files to be environment aware, it gives another feature that you should just be able to switch on without having to write a whole bunch of boilerplate code to support it. Of course, I want to be able to build simple command line apps and complex command line apps. That's a given. But I also want validation. Validation for my options and for my arguments. A lot of the frameworks out there provide option validation, but not argument validation. It's still user input. We still want to validate it, so why not? Sometimes things like option conflicts, required options, are very useful. And then there's this one. Option plaza is just not good enough. It's too verbose. You can't specify the same, the same option multiple times, like you would in curl, for example. And there's another problem with most of the existing command line frameworks. They persist in wrapping a nice idea cell on top of option plaza. But that's just obfuscating the issue. We need a nicer option parser. There's no getting around that. And then there are elements that will support us in creating good design. So separation of concerns. We should be doing this instinctively. So now why aren't we doing it already? Sensible way to structure your app. You know, opinionated software is awesome, like I mentioned before. Rails gives us a structure for our web application. So a command line framework should give us a similar or different structure for uh, command line applications. But it should be there. It should be opinionated. We want to write, we want to make writing specs for our command line apps really easy. We don't want it to be hard, because then we just won't do it. Writing a logic as part of your DSL, that's just not good enough. It should encourage modular design rather than monolithic design. In fact, it should more than encourage modular design. And if all this wasn't enough, you just wait, because there's more. It should come with idioms already built into it, or at least with things that we can turn into idioms over time. Our spec is a really good example of this. So this spec here is full of stuff that has become idiomatic our spec over time. This means we need to think about what would go into a well-designed app built using our hypothetical framework. It's really nice when you don't have to wait for your command line app to actually start up before it can do stuff. This is really hard because if you're writing a script for a Rails app, for example, you might want to load the Rails environment, and we know we all know how fast that is. But at least it's something to strive towards. We want it to be as fast as possibly can be. Initializer support. Rails has it. If you ever built a significant Sinatra app, you've probably built it. It's a, useful, it's a useful thing, because even if we're writing a command line app, we might still be using other gems. We might, you know, we might want to use Twitter, and we might want, might want to pass an API key from the command line, and then we want to use that API key to configure our Twitter gem. And initializer is a perfect concept for doing that. We want to be able to, um, we want our wraps to have more output or less output as needed. And then, of course, the framework itself should be well designed so people can come and read it and they can contribute. We always fail with this, with documentation and examples, because it's really hard. And then lastly, we want an awesome name that starts with R because it's a Ruby theme. I vote for this. <laughs> because it's got an acronym that isn't used by anything. And that's really hard to find. And if you say the full name out loud, make you sound like this, <laughs> which is really fun for everybody else. So that's a lot of features. But Rake is familiar and ubiquitous. And if a framework wants to compete, it needs to offer a lot of stuff out of the box. More importantly, there shouldn't be too many situations where you just can't do something using a framework. 
Because rape is so unopinionated, you can always hook it in one way or another. We want people, the first time you use your framework, to go, wow! Just like the first time that they saw the Rails blog presentation that DHH did. Because that would, that's what gives a project real legs. And in fact, there's already confusion between rake and command line apps. We have, we have rake db migrate, but we have rails generate migration. What is rails generate migration? Well, it's just a command line app. More precisely, it's a command line suite. So why not instead have this? More than that, if I have a rails app called foo, I want to be able to do this. So foo generate migration, foo db migrate, and foo anything else I can think of. And that would be really, really nice. So what kind of developer would I be if all I did was theorize about this stuff? So I rolled up my sleeves and I tried to turn some of my thoughts into reality. Of course, at the time, my thoughts weren't quite as well formed and opinionated, but we'll come back to that. So I built a command line framework and I called it s which, as it turns out, is a really unfortunate name. <laughs> You can imagine what comes up on the first page. That's not my framework. <laughs> this is not the only unfortunate name in the Ruby world because we have gems like this. <laughs> and the popular book on Rails 3 is called the Rails 3 way. I mean, <laughs> they did it a couple of weeks during the editing process. And of course, recently they released the Rails 4 way. So obviously, obviously they didn't pick up on it at all. So, <laughs> at least it makes me feel a little bit less depressed about my own poor naming choices. So I'm not the only one. So, as for, as I mentioned, my thoughts weren't quite as advanced as they are now when I built it. So unfortunately, as ended up with most of the same issues that we talked about above. It hits some of the nodes but completely misses others. Luckily, it was just good enough that I've been able to use it a lot. Uh, for many different apps across two jobs now. Which is how I arrived at my wish list of what a great command line framework should be. Maybe, maybe I can morph s into something nicer one day, but right now Ray is still ace. But here's the thing, it's fun using your own gems. You get to see just how other people use it, how effective your documentation is, and which features were less than awesome. Trust me, it's a little bit like this. <laughs> At one point, one of my friends said, it would be great if Escort had like a really simple example, so people could get the gist of how it works at a glance. And, and, and I was puzzled because right there, it's there, see? Another time there was some major confusion about how Escort configuration works, and once again I was I was like, look what you possibly mean, because it's right there. Look, in two places. I mean, all you had to do was scroll down. I spent hours writing the documentation. Why won't anybody read it? Plus, I was sitting right there. You could just ask me. The point is, it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is how other people use it. Even if you think that things are, are obvious, if people can't or won't find it, that's really valuable feedback. And the feature feedback you get from having uh, your users right there is absolutely amazing, which is how I was able to compile the list of features that a command line framework really needs before it can be embraced by all. And while I'm on the subject, here are a few thoughts about open source and the people who do it. If you ever meet somebody who does open source, even if you absolutely hate what they do, shake their hand and say thanks, because open source is really, really hard. And it takes up a lot of time. Having said that, lots and lots of open source code is really, really crap. Because open source is really, really hard. It takes up a lot of time. So you kind of choose between code that works and code that's nice, and it's an unhappy medium. And also, documentation is really boring. But you have to do it anyway, because otherwise no one will ever use your project. So I guess what's the general gist of a lesson here? Obviously, I don't expect anybody or everybody to stop using Rake tomorrow, but hopefully every time you write a Rake task now, it'll make you think a little. 
because great change begins uh, with, with a single step and hopefully a single presentation in this case. So consider, consider writing some command line apps. They're easy and fun and very, very unixy. Maybe try escort, because I'm really, really nice. <laughs> but if you don't want to try that, uh, and you really love Rake syntax, maybe you can try Thor, because it was written by this guy. <laughs> and of course, that's just a small, cute animal and can't write any code at all, because it has no opposable thumbs. <laughs> what I mean is it was written by this guy. Alternatively, you could try something like Glee, because it was written by the guy who wrote this book. So when people ask you about it, you can say, I'm using a tool written by a guy who literally wrote the book on command line apps. And that's kind of cool, I think. Mainly, I think it's important to always question the established way. Just like a language needs to keep evolving and moving forward, so does the community and the ecosystem. We have surpassed rate, and we need to take a next step. Because if you think about it, at one point, this guy had a thought. And his thought might have been, I want to write a blog really quick. Or, or it might have been that web development should be much easier than it is. Either way, we got rates. And we took a step forward as a community. And in fact, the whole software world took a step forward. And even before that, this guy had a thought. And his thought might have been, what if Perl would be less crap? <laughs> and we got Remy, which was even more awesome, because if those things hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here right now. And that would make me feel like this, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Alan.